that number has been floated. Right, and then you look at West Des Moines is the top, and they're over seventy thousand. So they're, you know, they've got. You know, per, per, you're right. Per capita, uh, they would have the, the the highest usage per capita. Yeah. And so, okay. Just, just an interesting comparison in terms of what what the what folks are being asked to contribute versus what what usage is. And you, we had to cut it off someplace. We, we had to start someplace. And again, working with the city managers, because we, we hosted the city manager uh, uh, committee meeting and floated this to the city manager starting there, um, and then took their input to their advice uh, from that point on. And, and this is kind of as a group, collectively, uh, what they recommended. Could, could you explain the residential use versus commercial? Like the zip codes are both uh, residential, individual, personal use. They are yes. As opposed to businesses coming. Come to life to point. Well, yeah. The, what we know, I can track the zip codes by zip code where right. where people are coming. That those forty three percent that are coming in to Iowa to do business in Iowa, we can track those well, and the vast majority of those are coming into a Des Moines zip code. Yeah. I just don't agree with you. Put the slide. That's a different answer. Yeah, OK. It increases the timetable. So where all this started was uh, the, the state of Iowa wants this project complete. They would like to have the project completed. Um, but they want to make sure that there is participation from the communities that would benefit the most. So that's where uh, the $34 million comes from. We've had a number of meetings with the state. Um, because of the dollars that they may use, being the American Rescue Plan Act dollars, uh, there are timelines on there. So it actually will speed the project up. Instead of being completed in 2028, which is today's schedule, it would have to be substantially completed by 2026 because that money has to be spent by 2026. We can do that. Uh, we have brought on our owner's rep team. Um, the board just approved a contract with them uh, last Tuesday, and we're, there is an RFQ on the street, a request for qualifications for the architectural firm. We'll bring them on so that we're, we're in ready to launch should all this funding come together. Because the other funding that we're seeking, of course, is federal funding. Part of that is through the Infrastructure and Jobs Act plan. Um, there's $15 billion in there for a normal airport improvement program, and then there's another $5 billion in that, in that act for terminal projects. Um, that is competitive. We already know the equation on the 15 billion, how much Des Moines will receive from that, and it's about 27 million over five years. It's split out over five years. The competitive portion, I do not know. But I know the more shovel ready you are, the more inclined you are to receive dollars. And so we are um, getting in line. We've got the programming done. We haven't started design, but we're bringing the architectural team on so that we can say we're shovel ready. We, we will start design more than 30 percent um, so that we're in a better place to compete for those dollars. Uh, what is the state? It's 300 million between both. What is the state saying they're going to uh, contribute? They, they have not given me a hard dollar yet. They want us to seek these other dollars, and then they want to be the last in. Um, but they have very clearly said, we want it done, and we're willing to seriously <coughs> at, at, at closing the funding gap. Kevin, okay. yeah, just, just to clarify, the only cool reception you had is for outlying counties, not the cities. Correct. The cities, in fact, Altoona and Bondurant have already gotten their resolutions back to me. I know tonight that three communities are voting, but uh, Des Moines being one of them, but West Des Moines, Ankeny, and Urbandale hasn't gotten back to me, but they were talking about voting tonight as well. Uh, so that would be the largest four uh, communities that will vote tonight, and I anticipate uh, that they would pass. 
Um, so things are, the communities are lining up and, and, and passing these resolutions. But yes, really the only cool reception that we've received was Dallas County. Okay. okay. Uh, so, and so what we're asking for is, number one, we're asking for the money, but only if we close the funding gap. We really don't want to, $34 million, don't even want money, I mean, that's a lot of money, but it won't do us any good toward the terminal if we don't close the funding gap through the federal government and the state. So I would ask that the resolution state that pending us closing the funding gap, um, that that money would be allocated to the airport uh, and then it's you know split over a time time period we programmed it for four years uh, you know if a community needs five or six years uh, to spread it out over five or six years we're okay with that as well as long as we know that money was coming in um, our construction loan is, is going to take us out beyond 2026 anyway so a four or five year commitment is, is fine with us. So I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, any other questions, be happy to try to answer them. Mayor, if I could real quick, just to remind the council that this has been the number one priority is a large capital project of the, of the metro area for quite some time. And so it's just, it's actually pretty exciting to think that we've got the opportunity to push it over the finish line <clears throat> with this action and then the leverage that we need on federal and state funds to bring it home. So I'm just excited to be able to have an item that's been on our list of things to do and find solutions for that we've been pushing and pushing at the federal level uh, for the additional passenger uh, PFC, is it right? And uh, unsuccessful in that effort, and so to have this opportunity is just a, a great, great uh, opportunity. Yeah, I got one question. Yeah. Um, it uh, why do we change the uh, uh, entrance coming from uh, the north? It used to be a little nice little. Uh, what, is there something wrong? <laughs> well, used to be a nice little drive in there. Now you got to take a hard stop and cut on in there. What happened? The two things. Um, the traffic at the airport's getting heavy enough that a stoplight was needed and, and we couldn't put a, a new stop, another stoplight at the existing. Yeah. But we all know where we're going when we come to the airport. We're drawing passengers from 92 to 120 miles away. They come to the airport once a year. They don't know where they're going. And on the old entrance, as soon as you pulled in on the airport, you had to start making decisions. Um, and it was causing traffic to back up worse out on the floor. If you remember, you know, immediately, do I go right here? There's a parking lot over there that was employee parking or the entrance to Signature. There's another road that cuts left right across from that. If I go a little bit further, do I want to go into the garage? Do I want to go in front of the terminal? And that simply was causing congestion. The new entrance spreads that decision-making process out. You can get signage in there so that uh, while the traffic may be slowing, I mean, people literally were stopping uh, on the old entrance trying to figure out where they were going. With uh, Allegiant operating now, we have people coming to the airport who I'm sure haven't flown for a very long time because they're, I mean, the amount of 10 and 12 ounce liquid shampoos and, and other things that are being confiscated at TSA is just, is just horrendous today. Um, so I mean, clearly they, they haven't gone through screening for a while, so. Uh, and by the way, it was uh, two years ago that uh, Aiden Fry passed away. So I got one of these uh, working at the University of Iowa booths. Remember Aiden Fry. <laughs> <laughs> does, does the feet, are, do we have the increase on the feet? Do we have the increase on the fee that you were looking for to the passenger facility charge? We do not. And, and the infrastructure bill, by, the, the industry fear is, and I, and I agree with this, the, the infrastructure bill is nothing more than a down payment on the need of the infrastructure in the United States. 
Uh, it's, it's about 20% of the total, with the airport side of it, is about 20% of the total need uh, at airports. The reauthorization bill is coming up. Um, it, it expires in 2023, and passenger facility charge will be requested in that bill from the airport industry. But, but I'm afraid Congress will say, well, we just passed an infrastructure bill and it's unnecessary, and it is still very, very necessary. This infrastructure bill, again, it's a down payment, and that's all it is. So can we do this project without increasing that fee? If everything falls in line here and if the state uh, steps up with the infrastructure bill that was passed, and then there's some additional discretionary dollars that we're hoping that we're in line for from, from the feds, then yes, we can. Um, I, we wouldn't be out here asking if, if we didn't weren't confident that we could do it. Um, okay. So I have a question from a, a timing perspective. And a little frustrating, and I expressed this to Scott. You know, we had a budget meeting yet last week, and we didn't talk about this would come. I think from our ARPA dollars, we didn't talk about this at all. Uh, and we're voting on a, a resolution potentially tonight. It, I will say I support it. The question I had is, is if we could move this to be part of our budget process or is the need and the timing such that you really need us to go tonight as opposed to February, March timeframe? Well, two things, as I explained, if our dollars are being used, then we have to speed the timeline up. And so, yes, it is necessary that we get these passed and get it in line quickly. The other thing is, is Des Moines being the largest metro, being Des Moines Airport Authority, it would help tremendously, I think, if Des Moines would go and, and be one of the leaders in, in pass and say, no, we've done it. I think that would help with all of the other, whether it's counties or uh, communities that we're asking it with, it. I think it would help all of them uh, pass theirs as well. You think it'll help with the counties that have given the cool reception? I think if Polk County will will get theirs passed, um, would probably help the most with with Dallas. But uh, um, uh, we were warned that Dallas might be kind of cool to begin with, and they were, and so we'll keep working on them. But if we can get Des Moines and Polk County both to go, um, I think that they, they will fall in line as well. So if like a Dallas County doesn't do anything, I suppose there's cities within Dallas County that would do it? Absolutely. Um, and you know, Clive for example, uh, great reception at Clive, because as we flow around the communities themselves, the cities, uh, very warm reception. They're very, very supportive. Um, it's just the county. It was just the three county supervisors that were. And then, is there a certain amount of the federal discretionary dollars that that are, are necessary to, to come in? I mean, you said the formula stuff is $27 million, and, and the state and federal I think you have 300 million on there. So, is the state willing to go up to 25 million? You know, 250 million. Like, are we thinking there's 23 million in discretionary, 50, 75? Like, what? I'm thinking that there's probably we're on the competitive side that Des Moines should be in line for 25 to 30 million there, and then to just do normal AIP, there's about another 25 million. But yes, those, the, the figure that you threw out are the discussions that we've had thus far with the state, uh, 200 to 250 million. Okay. Now, all of that discussion, there's still uh, uh, guidelines coming out with ARPA dollars, with the ARPA funding, that, that has not been finalized yet. And so, of course, once you get the final ruling on what people can and can't do with our money, that could change some of that discussion. But I know they're very anxious to get this project done. They have, they have, the state of Iowa, the governor specifically has heard us um, that we are Iowa's airport. If you're, if you're doing business with the state of Iowa, you're coming through the 
It's just that simple. That makes us Iowa's airport. We are the largest airport and we're the fastest growing airport in the state of Iowa. Um, she understands the economic impact and she wants the project completed. So, Kevin, when you look in your crystal ball, will this take fewer years for construction than, let's say, LaGuardia? <laughs> yes. Uh, so, uh, Construction, this is planned for two years of design and two years of construction. Um, and that gets us, uh, 2022 gets us out to 2026. That's part of the reason we're bringing the architectural team on now. You know, another piece of this is the, the uh, construction management at risk bill that's at the state of Iowa. If that would pass, that would help speed things up as well. The state passed it. I'm sorry, the Senate passed it. The House didn't take it up last year. Hopefully that gets taken up. But that's another piece of it that would help tremendously. If we have to design all this and then go to bid, it is it will be a full two years of design, then you bid it, and then you can start construction as opposed to kind of doing it in packages. It would speed things up. So two years and not two decades. Two years, exactly, yeah. Okay. yeah. Gotcha. Okay. <clears throat> Any of these numbers come in lower, like the, the federal or the state come in lower? Are there ways to phase this in? Like, is there a piece that can be taken out or delayed so that the terminal could get done, but like the parking garage, or the new parking structure later? I mean, is there flexibility, or do we have to have all this lined up well, for this to go forward? Certainly, you would look at value engineering. Uh, what is in that figure is, if you remember the original plan called for 14 gates with four more being added in 2040. Uh, but we weren't supposed to have a need for the full 14 gates until 2027. We, we broke that barrier in 2019. Um, so, so we're way ahead, the growth is way ahead of where we anticipated. Um, right now, today, we are running at about 90% of the 2019 levels, and business travel is not back yet. Most of that is the increase in leisure travel, again, with, with three more flights, three more airplanes overnight on Legion, that has increased the leisure travel quite a bit. Just couple that with the pent up demand uh, from the pandemic. When business comes back, if it comes back with the same surge, uh, as leisure travel has, this terminal will not handle it. We, we will, I mean, we've gone right by the 14 gates. We need to put 18 gates in. So the 18 gates are back in there. Uh, <coughs> 18 is in that 575 number? Yes. Um, swing gates had originally gotten cut to get it down to that $500 million figure originally. A swing gate allows for uh, gates to be used both for international flights. You swing a couple doors and then you can use them for domestic flights as well. Remember, international flights have to be kept completely separate. Uh, so we would have two gates that we would have swing gates and then space down underneath. Probably wouldn't uh, finish the space, but actually have the space for the Federal Inspection Services for those international flights. So we're getting ready for that because the airlines are looking at airports the size of Des Moines for non-stop international flights. They would prefer to operate at this size of an airport. Uh, it's less congestion, quicker in and out. Um, fees are a little bit lower than they are out of the LAX or, uh, or LaGuardia. The, those places are landlocked. And so uh, they're looking hard at the size of an airport. And we cannot handle a commercial international flight today. Uh, the airport handles about 300 international flights, but they're all general aviation. If you think about the corporations here in town, Principal, um, Cortiva, those types of, of organizations that are multinational organizations, they're flying their corporate aircraft from wherever Europe, uh, South America, coming directly back to Des Moines nonstop, and, and that flight is getting handled then by customs. That's what makes us an international airport, and that's about 300 flights a year. Uh, but a commercial flight, we could not handle because we have no way of keeping those passengers and baggage separate. 
So the new terminal will allow that. That new terminal, yes, yes. So I, I bring that up because as we value engineer, if we don't close that funding gap and we say we're almost there, can we cut something? Um, if that were to get cut, um, that would save some funding. But the garage that you asked about specifically, construction on the garage will start in 2023. It is under design today. And we need to get the garage in and completed um, um, before the construction on the terminal starts. Uh, as, as you look at the, the linear flow of these projects, there's, you know, there, it's like set of domino, dominoes. You have to get certain things done before the next one can launch. And the garage needs to go in um, before the terminal construction starts. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you for considering us. Appreciate it. Kevin, thank you for coming down and updating us. This has been a project that we've watched for a long time. And uh, some days I think too long, but uh, let's let's keep it moving. And and uh, I agree with you. I think that we've got to lead by example if we want the rest of our Central Iowa team to jump in with us. Uh, we can't be the last one in. So Kevin, thanks, and let's keep moving forward. All right. Scott, looks like we're going to talk about 134 and 135. Yes, I think we've got a team effort on this with <coughs> development services, Aaron and Jason. Good morning, Mayor, esteemed council members. Erin uh, Olson Douglas with the city's development services department. This morning we have a wide-ranging presentation on a number of topics and uh, proposed updates related to our zoning, planning, and design chapters of our code. Um, there's basically five pieces in here, the first of which is basically an annual summary and overview of the work that staff has been doing, their boards and commissions have been doing related to these chapters of our, of our code. So Plan and Zoning Commission, Board of Adjustment, Historic Commission. Um, we're happy to report that timeframes are down from where they were earlier in the course of implementing this code. Um, meanwhile, our volumes, our review volumes are up. So that's good news uh, community-wide, I would say. Um, so over time, we believe that this tracking will help us to understand when and where we have issues within the code that need update that we need to bring forward to you for, for consideration. Um, so Jason will go through that summary. And then we have a couple of policy alignment issues. Um, the first of which is a stewardship change that updates our codes to align with the stormwater policy that you all adopted last month. Um, and the second of which is a discussion on potentially expanding accessory housing units in the community. And this would align well with what you did with tax abatement also last month. So we have some ideas there. Um, then fourth, we have a proposal on looking at the way that our code requires undergrounding of overhead electrical. Um, we have recognized, as we did with, as we did with uh, sidewalks and garages earlier in the year, that this is one issue that routinely is sending projects forward to Plan and Zoning Commission. Um, and while it's an issue that you know, we would really like to see, I think we all would like to see, it builds resiliency in the community. It's just a cost that is um, oftentimes overly burdensome for projects to implement on their own. So we have some ideas there that Jason will present to you. And then uh, finally, when we brought changes forward to you earlier this year, you had asked for an overview of what triggers site plan compliance and what that means. So Jason will walk through those site plan compliance triggers and a few ideas that we have there to update some changes. In general, the goal with that site plan compliance 
is to improve our nodes and corridors incrementally over time and to do so in such a way that uh, it gets implemented while projects are already making changes so that it becomes an incremental increase to the project budgets. We have found in some cases that's not necessarily true, and so we have some ideas about how we might look at that moving forward. Um, so with all of that, it's a lot of territory to cover. Um, we believe that it helps to show our continued commitment to uh, constantly improving upon our our codes as we implement them and move them forward. Um, we did we did ask Jason if he would if he would uh, make this presentation and in honor of Iowa State's undefeated season thus far and John Moore, we asked if he would shave his head. But unlike you, Councilmember Gray, he wasn't quite as spirited <laughs> with that. <laughs> so with that, go ahead, Jason. Right, thanks. Good morning, Mayor, members of the Council, Jason Van Essen with the City's Planning Staff. Go ahead and uh, just kind of run through the presentation. Um, let's see if this will work. Okay. Uh, as Aaron alluded to, we have a, a variety of subjects that we wanted to visit with you, but I think it's important to uh, start and kind of get an understand of where the planning and urban design division is. We're the division that um, is charged with implementing 134 and 135 uh, predominantly. Uh, so I have some numbers to share with you and kind of how what we've been doing this year, what our boards and commissions have been doing. Uh, this is the caseload for this year for uh, planning zoning commission, uh, zoning board adjustment, and the historic preservation commission. Uh, the P and Z uh, they see such a variety of items. We broke that number out. Um, amongst uh, the type two kind of site plan related reviews and then they lumped everything else together in a category of three zonings, plats, PUD amendments, vacation requests. <clears throat> How does this compare to before we adopted the, the new code? Um, I, don't, I don't have that number, um, but I can get back to it. We had in an earlier presentation, um, when we did code amendments or earlier this year, we did have that number, but so, if you want to give me a moment after the workshop, I can pull it up. Yeah, that would be great if you just send it to us. Sure, happy to do so. Uh, so, first slide was our boards and commissions. This slide is uh, specific to staff reviews. So, we, have, to date, have reviewed 141 site plans, uh, 456 residential uh, applications. Residential applications can um, vary from a shed, garage, where planning staff is looking at a setback, all the way up to a new construction house where we're uh, reviewing the, you know, the entire design of the site. Uh, platting activity, uh, 63 plats to date. And again, this has a wide range of what that means, much like the residential review. That could be a plat of survey, where it's a simple lot split, um, all the way up to a large subdivision. And then, Certificate of appropriateness, that is the, um, the, the review process or decision in order from the Historic Commission or staff. Uh, we review all those applications. There are some um, that we actually issued the COA for, and that's why this number is higher than what you saw for the HPC case load. <clears throat> Uh, dialing into the site plan review process um, and, and uh, residential review, so just kind of thinking specifically to Chapter 135 and the Type 2 reviews. Uh, this uh, graphic shows that staff has reviewed um, just about 600 applications. 100 of those ended up um, going to the Planning Zoning Commission for some sort of uh, design alternative request. And then uh, we had, we've had three uh, to date appeals, including today's agenda, that uh, made it to the council. So that's, I think, what to take out of here is that of the volume that we see, less than a percent are um, getting in front of you as a, in a form of appeal. The two appeals are for uh, existing uh, businesses that were vacant, or not, at least one of them was, right? Yeah, and then I believe that um, the third one was the Fairway project. Yeah. So, and then we do have some trend information. So, <clears throat> what I've, what we're putting together and that we'll continue to build on is tracking our numbers uh, since the implementation of the new code. So this is comparing 2020 to 2021. Uh, this first slide, you know, we're looking at uh, that kind of total of what staff has reviewed. 
You see the increases and then decrease with the residential reviews. Also trends for our boards and commissions with their applications going up over the last couple of years. <clears throat> with that, that's the, the kind of end of uh, the summary of the numbers. Uh, if there are any Can questions you, on that? Can you back up one? Sure. I want him to back up two. No. Are you saying board of adjustments actually gone up from 2020 to 2021? Yes. But those numbers are still lower than what they would have been under the old code. You know, I get I get the uh, meeting notices, and I, I it just doesn't look like there's a whole lot on the agenda anymore. Well, I'm kind of surprised to see this kind of result. Well, these numbers are still, whether it's the 70 or the 86, if you look back to the glory days of the board, uh, you were on there and others, mm -hmm. you know, we would often have, one month would have 20 or so items. So, if you, you know, if we were, if you factor that out times 12, that's still substantially higher than, than these. So, I, I, there are agendas are quite a bit less than they used to be. Uh, uh, we've had a few months where, you know, they've been a little higher, but still nothing like the old days where we might have to <laughs> take a break and have pizza or something and then continue the meeting. I think we had one meeting that lasted until what, 10 o'clock? Absolutely, we had one that started at 10 o'clock and ended at eight o'clock yeah. that night. And the subject matter that the board is reviewing has changed too, you know. Now it's uh, conditional use applications, um, separation, uh, signage relief. Uh, you know, in the past we would have garage setbacks and all the other stuff and now with the P and Z. Can you go back one more slide? Sure. When you talk about residential numbers, there's uh, site plan reviews, residential 548, 456 in 2021 have our permits for residential buildings gone down in total i suspect that that's why those numbers have dropped i i would assume so uh, because when i there's I, not much building going on in des moines other than the nonprofits. actually i if you don't mind sure um, i reviewed those numbers with cody about probably it was probably about a month ago we had some inquiries from the media um, we're still working on getting our tracking back in such a way that it can be more of a routine um, output. But it looked to me like our housing numbers were up. Our actual new construction permitting on housing was up. It's up by, I want to say it was in the 15 to 20% range. Okay. It's in all of the other types of residential changes where I think we're seeing the drop. So I can get, we can work on getting you okay. that permit information over the next, I, I don't know if we can get it out before the holidays, but certainly in the next couple weeks, we can get that information to you. Um, we, we have put it together and it needs updated a little bit. So, so we can either send a previous summary or an update. And that residential would include like remodels and? Yes. Yeah, th this number is very expansive. I mean, this yeah. is remodels, garages, sheds. Because I don't think we built that many houses in Des Moines this year. No, 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 no. This isn't a reflection on the number of new houses but the number of new houses is has actually increased over 2020 yes yes it was a it was a down we had a really it was at a really high level in 19 but we've seen a nice if you take out 19 we've seen a steady increase from 17 18 19 was a blip but then 20 and 21 it's, it represents a nice steady increase how does that compare? How does that compare to the suburbs of where their growth in, in residential has been? So, when you give us those numbers, can you look at, you know, the Grimes, the Ankeny's, um, you know, s some of those Altoona, some of those where we've seen. I'd like to know what their growth has been compared to what ours is. Yeah, we can try to get that. Um, we have to rely on home builders, the Home Builders Association, for that, um, and. The way they count and the way we count is a little different, so the comparison isn't apples to apples. But yes, we will get we will get you what we have on that. You can call each city and they'll give you that information. Yeah, we can we can do that as well. Were there any more questions on the number part? No. Not when we how do you, how do you feel that the new code? Have you do you feel like it's being successful compared to? Um, 
the timing process and when people are going through the permits and, and, and things like that. Yeah. What type of feedback are you guys getting? Um, well, I, um, as Aaron mentioned, our review times have gotten substantially lower, much more now that we're kind of staffed up and people are getting used to the process. I haven't received, you know, the kind of angst and complaints that, you know, when we first rolled this out and we were going through the reorganization, um, we have heard a lot of negative feedback and it's gotten quite a bit better. And actually sometimes people are surprised at how fast we're getting our comment letters back to them. <coughs> So just quickly, these are the four areas of discussion that we have left. Um, as Aaron mentioned, the, I just want to quickly touch on the stormwater uh, component of Chapter 135, mostly just because on your agenda tonight, uh, there's an amendment to Chapter 135 to uh, change some uh, language that references Chapter 42 uh, that you adopted in early November. P and Z's already reviewed that at their meeting in December, so it's uh, forward to recommendation approval. That's on your agenda tonight. Um, anyway, it just wanted to make sure that you you know saw that that's part of the process that we're going through. It's one of it, one amendment. We'll be continue to work on other amendments. Uh, we do have staff here if you had questions, but if, if not, I'll go ahead and move into AHU discussion. Can you? Give us a deeper dive into that. It was very confusing to try to read the blue letter and, and some of that. I had some questions for Scott and Davis to me this morning, but <laughs> if you can uh, if you can go into a little deeper dive and let us know exactly what changes and, and how consistent that is. Sure. What um, we're looking at. So the, from the perspective of just chapter 135, it, it points to uh, chapter 42. So the stormwater components in, in our planning design ordinance are very minimal. They, they just really point to the other part of the code. I have engineering staff here that can speak. If, if you have questions specific to what's well, been amended in 42, we can bring them up and have them answer those questions. Uh, but as it relates to 135, it's very, um, just a, it's a reference. It's, it's kind of clean up to make sure we're being consistent. I mean, essentially, if you look at what was in 135 previously, it was almost its own standalone language, and we now have very specific language in Chapter 42. Rather than have that standalone language and this reference that maybe aren't consistent, what they did is they removed a bunch of language and just referenced the Chapter 42 stuff that we previously passed. So it, it's just a simpler, clearer way to do it. We weren't ready to have one when 42 was going through the adoption process. We weren't ready to have the 135 with it, but they they really go hand in hand. It's just making sure that all parts of the city code are um, current, reflect each other appropriately. And Jason, um, are our stormwater policies in sync with the, our suburban neighbors? Well, there is that. Um, at, at, in sync with what we're doing. There was a, a regional effort, and if you want to, okay. yeah, sure. Sorry. Can can I say one thing uh, before you get started? Sure. The answer is they're not consistent, uh, as we see it. And I know that that uh, Bill, you and I've uh, worked on a lot of stormwater issues in up in in your area. But I got to tell you, we've been looking at everything from uh, Four Mile Creek uh, to Walnut Creek to whatever to try to coordinate our efforts because we see it because we're towards the confluence of all these these water passages. Uh, I will tell you that prior to 2018, it was sort of interesting as we worked on Four Mile Creek uh, to to see that the. Uh, um, acknowledgement of the necessary uh, things that needed to take place picked up substantially when 1,500 houses got uh, uh, inundated with water in Ankeny uh, off of Four Mile Creek. And I think that uh, we've got to look at all these watersheds and all of our suburban neighbors need to understand that, that ultimately they're going to see the same kind of things as this water flows through their Communities up to is they hard surface more uh, stuff. Is they look at uh, not uh, containment controlled release. They were just dumping it in the nearest uh, 
uh, ditch and, and send it on to essentially end up uh, in Linda's uh, ward around Four Mile Creek. And we were trying to figure out how do we control that and get everybody to work together to do that. And I think we're getting a little closer to it as we see some of these, these events. But we've been working on this for a really long time, including some of the parking lot stuff that, that we've been working on for literally decades to try to slow the flow that comes off of these hard surface uh, areas and to lower the urban heat island effect and everything else that we have done uh, to try to improve um, our stormwater um, response and to slow the flow if at all possible. So I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Mayor, Council Members, Adam Prelip, City of Des Moines, Engineering Staff, Permit Center. So I've been working with this on with Jonathan Gaynell, Patrick Bean. Uh, I guess to answer the question specifically, this capital crossroads was meant to bring all of the standards of all these communities together. We're essentially adopting that same thing. So the goal is that all these communities will have the same. There might be some subtle differences, but some of these have already adopted. I believe Ankeny did not adopt this yet, and I, I don't know if they're going to reassess that or not. But ultimately, our standards were pretty strict before. I don't, I don't think ours are changing that much. We're adding kind of this medium storm event, um, channel protection volume. That's really going to be a great benefit that we'll see. Some of these other communities have already adopted that. I think Urbandale already did last year. So you're getting developer response kind of based on what they've seen and they're giving feedback to us and we're gonna work with them on, on figuring things out, especially at a staff level. If it comes back and we have to modify our ordinance a little bit, then, then we'll do that. But until we adopt it, the effective date's February 1st. If we see things that need to change, then we'll have that discussion again, is how I look at that. So can you give us a list of the other communities that have adopted our stormwater that we're adopting before tonight's meeting? I think, yeah, I think that's not a problem. Okay. I don't have that on my head, on top of my head, but uh, we just went over it last Friday, so I think I did. Perfect. That would be beneficial. And, and who else is considering some of these updates and where they're at in their process? Sure. If they're going to the council, if they're, you know, if they're just, if, if they voted and said, no, we're not doing that, um, that would be, that would be beneficial for us uh, to be able to make yep. some educated decisions on what other communities are doing. Yeah. You, you realize we already adopted the yeah. updates. It, I mean, it, there are a couple of things where, while you do that. I mean, for example, the topsoil ordinance, uh, the buffer ordinance that a community like Clyde has done that is another best practice that I don't think made it into Correct. some of this, but I think those are the type of things that if we're talking about leading in the metro, that we should be joining communities like Clive, which is also doing this because they're an impacted community. They're sort of landlocked and downstream. We're downstream as well. I think we need to talk about those type of uh, those type of additions to code, and then work to bring other communities along with that. Yeah, I don't, think they, I don't think they have much buildable land anymore if they're doing topsoil. I mean, I. Don't, I they're just like you said. They're landlocked, and they're they're probably not a lot of new development that that's going to affect uh, with their topsoil ordinance. They're still building homes. And then just to, to clear up exactly, Councilman Manuel, Councilman Manuel said the the schematics of we had the stormwater's policy kind of moved and lived into 135 when that new code started, and this is. Going, moving to 42 is just a much cleaner way to separate that. It is now not a site plan issue, it's a stormwater issue. So that's pretty, um, that, it's more of a cleaning that up from that perspective. All right, anybody, anything else? Thank you. Sure. Thanks, appreciate it. All right. Uh, Next uh, subject matter I wanted to discuss was um, accessory housing units and, and looking at addressing the interests and expanding where those are allowed. Uh, currently, Chapter 134, is, which is the zoning code, uh, defines them as a living unit that is secondary in nature to a primary unit. Uh, the property owner must reside in one of the units. 
And the AHU's maximum floor area is 50% of the primary unit, so it can't be any bigger than half the size of the house if it's, um, that's the arrangement. You can only have one AHU per lot. Um, they can actually, an AHU can be located within the primary building, like a, a basement apartment, that sort of thing, or maybe it's at the back. Uh, more commonly, we think of them as a detached structure near where you are, which is allowed as well. And in, one cha in chapter 135, which is the planning and design ordinance, we have design standards and performance standards for the freestanding AHUs, uh, you know, dictates that you have to have a parking spot, uh, the architecture needs to relate to the primary building, those things. We don't have a lot of uh, examples in, in Des Moines, but uh, this is probably my favorite, probably the oldest one in town. This is in Sherman Hill on um, Woodland Avenue. It's a historic carriage house that some time ago was converted to a, a separate secondary unit. Formerly owned by uh, our Bob city Mingle. planner, Bob Mingle. That's right, the great Bob Mingle. <laughs> um, here's another example in Des Moines on uh, Foster Drive. A new construction example in Sherman Hill. And then uh, recently, you might recall that there was a rezoning request in the Wayland Park neighborhood uh, property just north of the university to allow 43rd. 43rd Street, thank you, um, to allow them to be able to build an accessory dwelling unit. This is the concept that we saw at the zoning stage. They, I don't believe that they've moved forward yet um, with construction. Jason, we're going to, are we changing the name from uh, ADU to AHU? What? It was an accessory dwelling unit. Our, That's what AARP keeps pushing. Yeah. It, there, there's, um, the reason why in our code they're called AHU is because elsewhere in the zoning code we refer to things as housing units. And so just for consistency of, of naming, when our code when we drafted, you know, was drafted, we went with the H just so it's consistent with all the language. Um, I've, I've had that question posed to me before and I have done you know some google search just to see you know are we the only um community that calls them something other than adus and i've actually i've found them called um accessory living quarters um so uh adu is predominant but ahu I don't, I don't think we're um too far out there so uh, we'll probably just for consistency sake keep it that's called an ahu so going forward we're going to call it an ahu that's it from our from our code Okay. You know, the, the average person on the street probably will call them ADUs, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Jason, yeah. let me ask this. Just, I, I can't remember exactly. And it, if it's a, an additional housing unit that is separate from the primary, they still are hooked into the same sewer. It's one sewer line. Does the sewer line, they're, they're not both having two sewers. Um, you know, that is a great, um, is Adam still for me either? <laughs> what was that, can be either? There's not a requirement. It's on the same parcel, they can share the same sewer service. Just keep in mind, if they ever get subdivided, then we may have an issue, because that's where we right. get shared sewer issues. Which, right. which we wouldn't want them to divide out anyway. So. No, and they have their own electrical panel, that's all separate. I, I couldn't answer that question either. I mean, I think that's a mid am it, it probably depends on how they want to track their their uh, building. And do they do they have to have a rental certificate? Uh, if it's a non-family member, yes. If it's a non-family, and that's uh, the same. The rental code treats them uh, no different than any other property. Where if you know if you're renting to your child or your mom, you don't have to have a rental certificate. But we've changed that. We've changed that some in our rental codes. Um, well, we. I know we have. I, I, there has been some changes in re reaction to state code. I, I think that's pretty consistent. We met with neighborhood services prior to this meeting and went over this with them. I don't know. Yeah. And we can get we can get clarification from Chris Johansson and neighborhood services on this. I think I thought he was planning to be here because it, I know that was a topic of discussion mm -hmm. about rentals. You know, just because I have a family member, I don't think I have to. Yep. Keep, and it, I know, keep it in good repair. Yes, and I think Neighborhood Services has been working on exactly this issue. I don't know where they've landed okay. on it, but this would follow whatever policy is coming forward out of Neighborhood Services with regards to rental okay. certificates. And according, I like what Linda said. 
uh, I hope we're putting safeguards in yeah. so that they, we don't end up in a situation where it ends up splitting the properties because then they got that sewer issue that comes yeah. into play. Yep, that's part of our recommendation and taking a next step forward okay. with this is how we so, be able to keep track of us. I was thinking if I'm going to build one in my backyard, it would have to hook into into the sewer from the main house. Yeah, I don't I don't see that we never approve a lot split. Um, I mean, it's is would somebody have the ability to go to you know like the commission to get relief to might allow it? Sure, but I, I just don't. If you look at the way the code is structured, how they're defined, that they're you know, accessory to a primary unit, um, that the owner has to live in one of the units. Once you divide the lot, you, you're not hitting any of the definition. It's of not, it's not an additional dwelling unit. Right, it's not exactly. So it's not, it wouldn't be allowed. Mayor, so, confirmation. So the uh, uh, property owner has to live in either the primary dwelling or the AHU. Yeah, and that's the way the code is written currently. I got confirmation from neighborhood services that you do not need the rental certificate for the family member. If it's on your property and you're in the primary in the situation. one of the two units. Jason, we can go back one slide. Does that uh, is that in the backyard of, of someone's home? That's blue accessory dwelling. Oh, this one? Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's on the road curves and that's actually facing an alley, but it's um, at the north East corner of Sherman Hill, so it, that's um, from the alley view. Okay, so we don't require just, I mean, with the car park there, they're able to, the, I, I'm not sure what that is. The, the unique challenge there right. is that that alley is mostly a paper alley, and so they paved as much as on, what's on their property, and then the rest of it is the alley, and it's just not, it's, it looks like it needs some more gravel. So that's the alley that goes up to the concrete? Yeah, it, it comes in at an angle. This is where the road curves up at the north end of Sherman Hill by the school. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it, but I see their, their retaining wall goes out further than their well, concrete, so I would assume that that's their property line. It's somewhere in that vicinity, but it, it, the alley is um, does create a unique challenge for them in this particular spot. They, they may not have paved all the way to the property line. <coughs> That looks a little rough, just, yeah. It's a nice building, so I, I was just looking for a do, do they live upstairs? Is that what no, they, this is they, a garage or? And they have uh, space. I don't know if they're actively renting it out, but there's finished space up there when that was constructed. And um, the house is sold since the um, individual that built this, he was gone. But when this came through our processes, they were, <coughs> secondary living space but um okay they, they may be using it as just like an office at this point it's a new owner okay. yeah. so um currently AHUs are allowed by right in n and nx districts the law two three or four units um so you you have to have a zoning uh, district in place that allows for more than one unit um, this, we are proposing to expand the ability to do this. Uh, we kind of have a hybrid approach. Um, in the A districts, DXR, RX1, and RX2 districts, we're suggesting that those be allowed by right in those districts, and that the rest of the N districts or neighborhood districts, it be a conditional use that would um, require board adjustment. The logic for the four districts that we're suggesting it be by right, those three that are the X, those are all mixed-use districts where your um, multi-families are already allowed, so it makes sense to allow the two units by right. Kind of matches what we did with the NX districts, and then the A district. That's the ag district where um, you, we expect large lots, and so the impact of somebody having an accessory um, housing unit on their parcel on joint properties is minimal because of the lot size. Just to show you what that looks like on map form, uh, this shows in orange the areas where AHUs are currently allowed by right. Uh, this map shows uh, the staff recommendation was adopted where they'd be allowed by right moving forward. And then this last layer shows where um, staff is suggesting it be a conditional use. So you can see that that does encompass the uh, majority of the city. 
Jason, why not just make everything by right? That's a great question, and that's where I'm going. <laughs> um, because we have a limited examples in Des Moines of, of this uh, use and, and limited experience and understanding how they impact neighbors um, and making sure that we have regulations in place that uh, help us make sure that they're successful. The worst thing that we could do is set this up where we have a bunch where they haven't been looked at terribly closely and then we have a lot of pushback on it. We want to make sure that we successfully roll this out and sometimes to do that you need to be a little bit cautious, at least that's our perspective, but we're certainly open to uh, the, the council's um, thoughts on it and direction that you would provide us. Well, it, I guess I, I'm concerned that part of what we have limited examples to date is we're making it a little too onerous and if we had more places that allowed it by right we'd get a few more examples so i like the expansion i like the conditional use everywhere what about a you know somewhere in between making it by right everywhere which i think we should eventually move to that should be the goal and i'd like to get there sooner rather than later but why not like a quarter mile or a half mile from any transit route, uh, allowing it by right. I think that would expand to where it's allowed by right a decent amount. We would have to um, look at that. Um, I, I, the, lo I, the logic is totally there. I, uh, I think we'd have to figure out a way to implement that through code language, but I think that's something that we could look at. Um, the cleanest way to do things is to associate it with a, a district. And so some of those, di sometimes a lot of our districts, they're on these corridors, they're already allowing it by right. So I don't know if you want to go back to. Right, but very clearly not within a quarter mile and a very narrow, sure. very narrow bandwidth along these corridors, right? And so you could. If you expanded a half a mile or a quarter mile, it would encompass a lot more along those corridors. <laughs> and your thinking is that um, we then, there's two ways. I mean, the first way to do that would be to do a you know do an analysis and like a city initiated kind of rezoning of broader areas of mapping exercise. Um, I don't know if you know if we might be able to do it as an overlay district. And we'll have to look into it. But I, I know what you're saying. Yeah. I was it, what if they change transit routes or something? So then, I mean, I think it would be easier to do it within the zones that they have to expand that out. I mean, we can we can look at that, and that's really uh, everything that we're presenting here today. I mean, we we're giving you some guidance or our thoughts, but we're really here to kind of hear what you guys have to say to help us move forward. So yeah. we'll we'll take that into account. Well, Jason, it, it isn't as though we're on the, the cutting edge on this. I mean, other cities are, other uh, progressive cities are way ahead of us on this. So, like, I mean, do you communicate with other um, uh, Twin Cities and elsewhere um, where they're, they're doing a lot of this? And um, why are we just... Now, sorry, dipping our toes in the water here. Um, well, every, I mean, we certainly can learn from other examples, and, and we can continue to do that. It, 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 but every city is unique, and we were trying to find something, one, that we could do quickly, because we're, we're, we'd like to make this change quickly, and this is a rapid way to do it, because it's just, it's just um, some text amendments. It's not a analysis where we do a bunch of mapping and have to rezone a bunch of parts of the city and different things, you know, so, this is a quick way to uh, make a change, um, move it forward, um, and, and, a, and monitor it and adjust as we go. It's kind of what I was wanting to end on. You know, we're not, um, this isn't like an end solution. It's more of an interim and to learn for a, a period of time, see what kind of, how the processes go. Um, the conditional use process allows neighbors to be notified. It is shorter than rezoning. So that was the, our thinking, it was kind of a fast way to cautiously expand this and not take um, risk of having that be side sidetracked by something not going right. So so the neighbors would have to be notified and then would have to go to PNZ also? No, conditional use is approved by the zoning board adjustment. So that if it was conditional use application, you submit your application within a month, you'd be in front of the board adjustment, they make a decision and you're done. 
Right now, if you have to rezone, you go to you have a neighborhood meeting, you go to PNZ, council receives and files, holds your hearing, you might wait, you have second and third reading, so it's 30 day process versus a 90 day process. I think the main key here, council, is that it's not an issue of slowing the policy down, it's the reaction of the neighbors, the neighborhoods, and having this, these additional units, and how will that reaction go? Will that be a positive reaction? And so that's that's the key here. We, we absolutely could do it by by right and by and by zoning. But yeah, well, you know, a lot of neighborhoods have really embraced change. So um, yeah, and, and they're going to have every opportunity. <laughs> yeah, and they're going to have every opportunity to do that within this quick thirty-day process. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, I think I'm I'm with Councilmember Boss. I think we could do this everywhere, and I think there'd be benefit to doing it everywhere. Um, I think this is this is an improvement. I mean, allowing the conditional use everywhere is certainly better than where we're at today, and expanding where it's allowed by right is better than where we're at today. But I, I mean, I'd like to see I'd like to see these allowed by right in in more places. Um, and quite honestly, the the quarter mile, half mile from transit, I mean, another another issue, and we might touch on it a little bit later with the, the site plan review trigger, the parking minimums, I think we, we could do the same thing, a quarter mile or a half mile within within a transit transit route, get rid of the parking minimums altogether as well. So the, the mapping exercise might have multiple benefits for future policy decisions. I do think we still all have to understand there is issues. I mean, I've got a nice area of just parking on streets. When you add more dwellings, uh, when one household is taking up five parking spots already on the street, I mean, I think we, to your point, yes, neighbors will probably have, you know, I think we need to be cognizant of what the impact of adding on more units, and um, not that everybody's going to do it. I'm for adding more units, but I think we have to be realistic as to uh, what becomes of uh, street parking and how it impacts everybody around them? I, I would I would agree with that. My my position is is yes. I think that they should be. Um, we should expand the area. I know that Home Inc is currently building one up on Euclid. It'll be, you know, a garage and then with an additional uh, dwelling unit above it. I'm all for that, but. Many of our neighborhoods are already on 50 foot wide lots and parking is a real problem on the streets. I know in my ward, it's an older neighborhood, smaller lots, um, parking, parking is an issue. I get a lot of complaints about why does one house get to park six cars on the street. So I, I would I would hope that we would still take into account some parking minimums. And is there any number? I mean, I think of an additional dwelling unit for, uh, you know, mom and dad as they get older, they want to have their own space, but the kids want them close by. That's usually two people or three people. <coughs> Could you put a family of six in this additional dwelling unit? I mean, is there any? Is there any limit? I, I'm, I'm assuming there's not. Yeah, it's it's no different than the challenges we face with uh, you know rental properties and, and the, you know the challenges that of what as a city we can regulate based off the of state code. Um, but going back to your question of parking, there is right now in 135 there is the requirement to have a parking space for that AHU. I, I would think we would want to keep that. Okay, um, I'll go ahead and move on unless there's anything else. The next item that I'd like to visit with you is um, the overhead utility burial requirement in Chapter 135, uh, which uh, requires them to be undergrounded where it's reasonably practical through the site plan uh, review process. So anytime you have a site plan, that's an item that we look at if you happen to bring it into full compliance. As Aaron mentioned, this has been 
A little bit of a challenge for us with the PNZ as far as our caseload. Um, right now, the code set up that only the commission can waive this requirement. There's not an opportunity for a type one design alternative by staff. This year, we've had 32 type two design alternatives uh, go before the commission. 40% of those were on the consent agenda. So a lot of these items are, um, are items where it makes, makes sense to do so. so uh, we would like to suggest adding a type one design alternative process to the code, allow staff to work with the applicants to make their processes go smoother and quicker. We do have some criteria in mind, and this is based off our experience with how these cases have gone with the commission. Some of the things that we would put into the code and look at the staff is, you know, it's location. Is it located on a node or corridor? Or is it or an area where it's not important for the utilities to be buried or less than important? Our next would be, how does it relate to the overall project budget? We've been using 10% as kind of a rule of thumb with the commission. So if it's the utility burial represents 10% or less of their project budget, I would use that as a rule of thumb if that makes sense. If it's over 10, it's uh, too, too much of a burden on the project. Uh, other things are, the utilities, are the transmission lines, how feasible is it to bury them? What are impacts on the joint property owners? Sometimes uh, to bury utilities, it can't be done unless you coordinate with a joint property owner that um, isn't you know, planning on doing improvements like you are, so that can create a challenge. Sometimes there's physical constraints, you know, uh, pull down a transformer, there's no place to put it on the ground. Uh, this approach of creating a type one with criteria is similar to what we did earlier this year with the sidewalks where we had that, that was becoming an issue at B&Z, added a type one to give staff some flexibility and work with that, excuse me, applicants. Uh, help, and that helped tremendously. So we're, we're suggesting doing the same here with the overhead um, utility barrel. And Jason, is the 10% uh, budget on the project, is that, um, include the changing of the electrical box inside and all that, or is that just actually burying the lines to the residents or the business? Sure, um, we usually give them the ability to put all that information together. We get an estimate staff coordinates with Mid-American, and so they'll give us a ballpark of what the mid and costs are gonna be. Right. And then if an applicant, we've had applicants put together, um, uh, you know, a, a quick bid from, from a contractor as to what's gonna cost them, and then we look at it together. Okay, so that is, you are going to look at it together. Yes, okay. yeah. So just to make it clear, are these overhead utility burial, this is a design requirement or alternative in areas that are already developed, or let's say, for instance, some areas uh, over on the south side that, you know, uh, are in the city of Des Moines, we've annexed, uh, and we're going to see subdivisions and it's going to be a requirement that all those utilities be underground is... Yeah, those, um, those are required to be undergrounded, and that's usually not a problem with a new subdivision. Uh, where we're facing challenges and where we would like the Type 1 for is, like you said, it's for these existing sites where um, the last part of my presentation, we're going to go through what triggers a site plan, but often this is somebody doing a renovation or an expansion, and they... Uh, hitting that trigger and that's where you know, smaller projects are the ones that have the small budgets where it doesn't make sense to do it does this impact their tax abatement at all um, i can't remember if we put anything in tax abatement about for commercial tax abatement uh, commercial tax abatement has a, s a standard that you have to have your service lines underground i don't remember is there anything beyond that do you, do you recall I just don't want to impact right. tax abatement. Right. Our intention with tax abatement, and I can confirm this, was to was to align our requirements with the zoning code. So if we make this change in the zoning code, our tax abatement policy would align. So it's kind of like the stormwater issue that we just talked about. We're trying to clean up um, some of these requirements that live in different places of the code so that it ends up being really confusing for people it's like double jeopardy um, this is intended that if it is approved as a type one review that staff would staff would provide if we make this change or if pnz approves it through a type two that the tax abatement 
um, the alignment and the qualification for tax payment would follow. Did we just make some of those changes that would go into effect in January? Did that yes. pass like the... Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. I knew that we had talked about it, I just couldn't... Remember. Yes. Uh, okay. The council considered the changes to tax abatement last month and approved okay. them. Yeah. Thanks, Aaron. I'll go ahead and move on to the last part of the presentation. Um, before we get into kind of the, the weeds on some site plan examples and how, and how they ended up in our processes, I just want to touch back on a point that Aaron made in the opening, that site compliance is a part of the city's overall goals to improve our corridors and districts. It's, it creates an opportunity for incremental change uh, when an owner is making changes to their property. Those collective impacts from people, these site plans, these projects, uh, renovation projects on a corridor or a district, they have a cumulative value. Uh, they do uh, improve the experience and perceptions of the corridors. And as has been mentioned too, that uh, from the perspective of landscape and open areas, uh, it's more than aesthetics. There's also opportunities for stormwater management improvement, uh, as well as heat island and different things along those lines. In uh, the site plan world, there's kind of five or so ways that you end up having to submit a site plan and uh, do full site compliance. Uh, broadly, you can kind of group all of those into two categories, new development and existing development. New development includes complete scrapes of a site, so it's not just greenfield, um, but it's also uh, an existing site that's been completely scraped and started all over again. Uh, existing development is the, you know, where we're doing renovations, expansions, there's been a change of use, and some of the other triggers that I'll go into in a minute. And you can see in Des Moines, that the bulk of what we review is existing development projects that are occurring with, uh, on existing sites, so about a little over 70% of what we do. <clears throat> Which, when you think of Des Moines as a, a built out, mature city, that makes sense. Within that existing development kind of subcategory, uh, these are how the different um, case types break out and like I said, I have specific examples I'll go into with each one of these categories. There's the renovation expansion, cumulative permit value trigger, change of use trigger, vacancy trigger. That last category, the site plan amendment, that's for when somebody has approved site plan and they're coming back and they just want to change something specific. Um, so to make all the numbers right, I have to put that in there, but that's kind of its own, own thing. <clears throat> Before we get into our examples, I think it's important to know what, what does full compliance mean? What are the elements that we are looking at that a, a property owner might have to address or make improvements to? So I have a list here. Uh, we look at landscaping and buffering, uh, fencing, mechanical equipment screening, whether it's ground mounted or roof mounted, overhead utility burial, uh, pavement and parking, how much, where it's at, those site, uh, sorts of things. Driveway placement and numbers. And the one observation here is that all of these are eligible for type one relief on some level except for the utility barrel. And that was very intentional. Uh, so staff has the ability to work with applicants to find design solutions that make sense to their site. And that's a challenge with developing code is you can't uh, predict every unique circumstance that you're going to get with every site. So you have to kind of create a goal and then create avenues or relief valves. And that's what the design alternative process is. I always tell people it's there to be a relief valve. It's to help you. It's to help let us be creative. It's not intended to be a punishment. Whether that's uh, working with staff with a type 1 design alternative or going before the commission. So the first trigger, new development. Includes complete redevelopment required under the previous code. Uh, here's an example: Coles at Merle Hay, aerial showing the property after it had been cleared. Uh, this is a clipping of their site plan and just a highlight of some of the design alternatives that were issued that were site related. Um, I'm going to focus on uh, site related issues in this presentation, um, not not so much the architecture, but. You can see staff reduced the amount of pervious areas required. It made sense here given the constraints and shape of the site, and they worked, um, Coles uh, worked really hard, and the, the mall folks, to find solutions, and we found a happy middle ground. Um, with the parking lot islands, uh, they were able to hit the, the standards of uh, 
a, an island for every stall, eight stalls, excuse me, kind of on this perimeter. But in this area here is a little more challenging, and we gave them a type one to reduce that down to, there's actually 11 spaces between those islands. And then uh, they got a type two from the commission to allow parking in the front yard for a storefront building. So that's, it's <coughs> back up a bullet point there. I, I, did you have a pointer there and I'm not seeing it or I, I'm, not, I'm not positive what's going on? I'm, I'm sorry. The, the area that... Uh, oh, you don't, you're not seeing my mouse. I apologize. Yeah. I thought, so the, um, glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. I would have made that mistake repeatedly. The, the parking along the south and to the east, that all complies with the ratio of islands to parking stalls. It's that kind of the north three rows where we gave them some relief. Those north three rows. Rows, yeah, double rows, you know, kind of does. Where the majority of the parking is yes. there. Yeah. North being the top of your screen. Top of the screen, yes, thank you. Okay. Top of the screen. Right here. Absolutely. There we go. <laughs> Uh -oh. Yeah, uh, that's. I think it's because I sit at the end here. So. Right. Here, point, point. <laughs> I appreciate it. I can use all the help I can get. So I think it's just. <laughs> Mine's a fancy case, so I think it's just structure. So yeah. Um, does that make sense? Yeah. Got it now. Oh, okay. All right. I apologize. I apologizing for that. I wonder if it was still working. The next, the next trigger of how we get site plans in our process are renovations and expansion projects of an existing site. Uh, we have what the 50% rule um, applies here. So if you are expanding a building by greater than 50% of the current footprint, you have to do a site plan and do full site compliance. If you're increasing the, if your project is equal to 50% or greater of the assessed value of the building, that's also a, a trigger to do full site compliance. If you have a small project that's under that, then we only review whatever change you're making. So if it's a, you know, a, a patio and you're not at the 50% rule, we're just looking at where it's going, we're not looking at landscaping, those things. This, this trigger, this process, uh, was required under the previous code. Here's an example of a project that came through. This is uh, Southeast 14th Street. Um, it's a multi-tenant building. Chase Bank is going into, it's going to occupy the vast majority of it. I think they have a small tenant space left. Um, so they had to do this triggered site, a site plan and site compliance. You can see kind of the lack of landscaping that exists today. And this is the site plan that was um, approved. And in this case, we actually, they were able to comply with all the standards. We didn't have to issue any design alternatives. The next trigger is what we call a cumulative permit value. So we track your permits that you've had since March 22nd of 2004. And when the value of all those together equal 50% or more of the assessed value of your property, you have to do a site plan at that point. So that's, that's catching small change over time. Um, so it'd be, uh, and then, then at a certain point after you've made in so many improvements, you keep investing in your property at some point, hey, you need to invest in the rest of the site. This was required under the previous code, uh, so we just carried forward that date and that process into this code. And are we looking to make some changes here? Um, right there? Yeah, I have some, when I get to the end, I have some suggestions to okay. go through. Because and I this think, is the one. That I think it's important, you know, it, in Des Moines, we have all these older buildings, we have vacant buildings, and it's hard to get them improved when we have when, you know, when they, when they have to comply with so many things. So I would hope that we would offer some relief. Yeah, we're, um, when we get to the end, most of my suggestions are related to cumulative permit value. I mean, because that goes back to what Food Bank did. You know, sure. the Food Bank of Iowa made some changes and then they were making some other changes recently and then the, the city went back and said, well, cumulatively you had made this many changes mm -hmm. so you have to add sidewalks and parking and landscaping and things and that sure. that just seems unreasonable. Well I, 
It's a balancing act because I'm going to show you a great example okay. of um, why, it's a, why it's a good thing. It, 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 is, it is a balancing act, but as a, as a business owner of a small business in the city of Des Moines that's been grandfathered into a lot of things, as you want to continue to invest in your building, um, when you require some of the new code things that, that we're going to require, it just you, you just rather say, no, I'm not going to reinvest in, in our building. So I think the, those are the type of things that we need to keep in mind as we're doing that as a dollar and cents thing. When there's no economic incentive, there's no TIF, you know, there might be a little bit of tax abatement, but it doesn't cover some of the costs that we're looking at to conduct to do business actually in, in this city other than to move your business into another part and, and just go build something new. We've got to realize that we could force people out. And so I'll be interested to see what some of your, you know, what we'd like to do. But we I, I hope that we can we can keep that in, sure in our minds, dollars and cents wise, as a look at it from another perspective. Yeah, no, I I, um, I don't know that I'm not suggesting that it's not expect, it's just a balancing of trying to make sure we hit all our objectives and take care of people's needs too. And and, and we do have some suggestions. I, I I'll go ahead and finish getting through yeah, those examples and then, then we can get to them. But here's an example of a um, a property that hit the cumul cumulative permit value. Um, I think property there on the southwest corner of the intersection. Uh, I was doing a tenant build out. Um, you can see that when it was originally constructed, it was constructed prior to our previous landscape standards. So even though it feels like kind of a newer property, it's actually fairly, you know, fairly old, and it predates our previous. What year was that constructed? Because that is fairly. I new. think it was about 20 or so years ago. Is that? Is that? No, it was it 2002, 2003. No, because it's Which, you know, I know, I know, it goes by fast. It sure does. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, you can see that although it had, you know, setbacks, it really didn't have any landscaping at that time. Uh, so uh, he, they did a site plan, and you can see there's a long list of type ones that we worked with them really closely on finding solutions that made sense for their property. And I want to just reemphasize that's the point of having the design alternative process, it's to help us find solutions, uh, work with applicants um, to try to find solutions. And we re uh, reduced or waived a number of things there. I'll go ahead and go through the list. Uh, we waived the street tree requirement due to the narrowness of the right of way. Uh, we reduced, um, there's a fencing buffering requirement, the ornamental fencing. We reduced the amount of, that they had to install, and kind of put it in more key areas. Uh, we allowed an alternative um, Landscape island design in that south, so it'd be the bottom bottom left hand corner. You can kind of see that landscape island. Uh, instead of putting it at the end, um, there's a loading dock and they had some concerns with snow removal. So this was a solution that staff and their design team put together. And then the um, parking lot island requirements along the building, we reduced those. You can see that there's really no park, there's no islands along the building. There's, the one to the east of the building, uh, there's not going to be a tree there because that's where they're going to handle the bike parking. And then they have the one island to the north. And then uh, it doesn't show up to everyone on this drawing, but there's actually a driveway that takes you all the, fifth, all the way to 59th Street. Uh, it's physically impossible for them to provide that buffer from the residential house to the south, so we waived that. And then this went to the commission for the utility burial. Um, and so that's that's kind of this project. Jason, yeah. Why did we uh, waive the uh, uh, trees along the parking? Are you talking or, about along the building or along the street? Because you know, if, you, if you drive down that uh, Merle corridor, there's no trees anywhere. It's pretty stark. It's pretty uh, dusty. And I uh, we I know uh, Aaron and I have been working on the Merle corridor plan. Is that something that we can finally get put in? I'll tell you what, it just, it, it's depressing right now because it is just nothing but asphalt, concrete, and buildings. Just the way I look at it. At least they're not vacant buildings. <laughs> well, <laughs> so I can take you down a corridor that's vacant. I got you. That has trees. Uh, I think when it gets more than there, though. I think we found uh, in this for this particular site, given the constraints, I, I feel really good about the happy medium that we found with them. I mean, you can see it, 
What's there today is just grass. So everything you see in the drawing, all those big circles, those are trees, and there's a lot of shrubs. This is gonna look amazing after it's uh, done. We just we gave them a, just a little bit of relief due to some physical constraints um, on the street trees with the, there's just not a lot of right away at the intersection. And then also up, up against the building where the parking was more important, uh, more of a priority for them. And how did the property owner feel about this process? Uh, not excited. <laughs> um, it did, so they, you know, they had a contractor, and I'm, I'm gonna touch on this at the end, but they, uh, this specific to this example, um, this relates great to where I was going, is that you know, they came in to get a building permit to do a tenant build out, and um, they're putting in, um, you know, they had to take a time out, do a site plan. Uh, we actually issued the permit, um, but it just kind of slowed them down a little bit, and we worked with them so they could move forward, but, um, not, not excited, I don't, I would probably be the way to put it. Yeah, because they had no idea it was coming. They did, They were coming in to right. improve the property so they can get a new tenant in there instead of having it sit empty. And then we said, oh, well, you've got to do all of these things now. What business, I mean, yeah, that's, that's tough being on the other side of it. So, we, and we don't, we don't give them any economic incentive to do some of these things. We don't incentivize when you come in and you have this and, and you hit that touching point, there's no help from the city to bring it up to existing code, correct? Uh, not, not, not specific to that. Okay. They, they may or may not be seeking something else. So, I mean, for, for Rich, I mean, he might not even, he probably didn't even know as he was going to do a tenant build out to get a new right. tenant in there instead of having it sit empty that he triggered this and all of a sudden, yeah, I mean. Right. All of a sudden, that guy's rent just probably went up. The, um, the next trigger that can cause a site plan is change of use. So this is where you're going. It's not change of occupant. You know, it's not retail to retail. It's the example I'm going to show is actually a former retail building going to a church. So it's change of use. Um, you're required to do a site plan, bring the site into conformance. Uh, this, again, all these triggers, they all existed under the previous code. So. Um, these are all of them uh, we've been doing for a long time. Uh, on, the only thing to clarify here is with multi-tenant buildings, so we have a strip building, this trigger only occurs if 50% or more of that floor area is getting um, changed of use. So it's not going to penalize the individual, you know, like the Eichner example where it's a small one particular tenant. He wasn't hitting change of use. He had the cumulative permit value. And also the thing to point out is you can get, uh, you can hit multiple of these. So, uh, you know, sometimes somebody's doing a major renovation, it's also the cumulative permit value trigger, but we'll, we'll classify that under the major renovation. That's the thing with our numbers. Here's an example, Experience Church on Euclid, uh, have been a furniture store. You can see there's a lot of pavement, no landscaping. Uh, this is their site plan, and um, we issued a couple of type ones for them. We waived the street tree requirement, state highway, it's challenges with that, and then also reduced the amount of pervious area they needed to uh, provide. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, that was an area they that was kind of the maximum amount of area they could um, cut out um, for uh, open space, green space. Uh, but they did, as far as the landscaping goes, they had. <laughs> they did a really nice job. It's yeah. better than the vacant Burger King building that sat there for how many years? So this is, uh, yeah, this is this will be a huge improvement. I mean, all these uh, projects are great examples of improvement. I and, wish and you it's had cool. a, a, an aerial view of it because it it's they really did a nice job. Absolutely. Of, 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 the, of what it looks like now. It looks very good. And it went from being a tax paying to a non tax paying? Well, in this particular case, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the site was it's not a burned but, up building. But it's, an, there, but it's an improvement because you can call it a furniture store, but it was really a warehouse for Slumberland, and all you saw were semis parked in there. Mm -hmm. So it, it's an improvement. It's yeah. an improvement in our neighborhood. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. And I think there's now another building being built. Further down, I don't know what it is, but I see they were clearing and that's, dirt. Yeah. And yes. YSS. Yeah, I, I didn't. I knew so, something was being built there. So yeah, know. so this is the uh, change of use trigger, and um, you know all these have you know all of these are great examples of improvement that help help the city. 
Uh, the last uh, uh, site plan compliance trigger or site plan trigger requirements vacancy for six months. So if a property's been vacant for six months, then you have to if when you when you go to reoccupy it, you have to do a site plan and bring it into conformance. Uh, this was required by the previous code, so this isn't anything new. Uh, here's an example, uh, Landmark uh, Missionary Baptist uh, University in 59th. It has Sorry. been a, I, had I must be running long, I think. So. <laughs> no, I thought I had it on silent. Sorry. The, um, and, and Bill's church has been a church, been vacant for some time. You can see a gravel parking lot to the north. Uh, a couple driver approaches, one that they didn't really even use, the University Avenue. So this was their site plan that they did. Um, we gave them a type one on the pavement setback. Uh, they did the what landscaping applied for a, a property of this size. And then uh, they did go to the Planning Zoning Commission to get a type two to allow parking in the front yard and then the overhead utility burial. Uh, with our last round of amendments, we've actually, this wouldn't have needed the type two. We could have approved the parking lot project to staff now. So I want to point that out as a positive that's occurred with those changes. Jason? Yeah. Just a quick question. Why do we pick a uh, period of six months? Uh, that's a long time for something to sit vacant. Can we go down to three months? I mean, is that going to cause any pain to anybody? I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing an empty building for six months. That, that takes care of like maybe a whole summer or a whole winter. Well, it uh, takes three months to get a building permit. So, I mean, I, well, I, 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 I mean, I, I, you've I, seen I, it in your area too, Joe. I know, but when you got to go through a process that we have laid out that's not real good when well, you got to redevelop it. What I'm saying is if, it, if nothing's going on in six months, yeah. is, can we spur something? That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, and the six month number is just we carry that forward from the previous code. And I know um, over the years, the council had uh, changed that. I think at one time it had been a year, and then at some point it got reduced to six months. And um, I, again, balancing out like priorities and, and, and stuff between like the two you know, points here, I think the, the six months. Um, you know, we'll we'll do whatever you guys you know adopt, but I think six months is fairly reasonable. So, is six months is that if someone comes in and, and starts the process, like we're going to redevelop that? Are we going to, well, you know, in, in one more month it's going to be the six months, and now you've got to go through the next process, or are we going to say, okay, since they came in to apply for a building permit, they met the criteria, and they're not. Yeah, if, six if, months. Right. If they're actively doing something, they're okay. going to get yeah. credit for that. It's it's really it hasn't sat for six months six and months. nobody is that interested. Right. And quite frankly, okay. most of these, by the time we're looking at them, it's it's they've been vacant for way longer than six months. Yes. Yeah, usually they are. It, Jason, this is another example, though, with a change in the utility burial. This would not have even had any type twos and could have been administratively. That's correct. This. Yeah, great example that that first bullet point of the type two is already been fixed, and if we can do something about the utility, this wouldn't have had to go to PNC, which you know adds another thirty days. So, um, last slide or two here are really um, suggestions from staff, some observations, and something that we're working on changing ourselves that we can do on the administrative side that doesn't take a code amendment. Uh, we've recognized, out of all these triggers, it's really the cumulative permit value and the surprise factor that, that, I, that, the, that has been the greatest issue. And, and it's because, you know, people don't track over time their building permits. I, it's not, uh, not, um, not unexpected. Uh, there's been delay because of that, and sometimes the site compliance costs can exceed the, the permit value. You know, these, all these projects, you know, the cumulative um, trigger, you know, that last project in can be huge or it can be a really small one. And so, you know, that that's um, something that we have observed as staff that um, has led us to think through this, both on maybe some suggestions for you, but something that we're going to do on the administrative side uh, for smaller projects is we're going to issue the permit. And when the threshold's been met with, a, with an email to the owner or a letter that says, hey, you've hit this threshold, um, know that the next time you come in for permit, you've got to do a site plan. We're going to give them the top opportunity to plan ahead. 
uh, try to take away that surprise factor. So allow, allow owners to plan for site improvements over time. This is what we can do this as staff administratively. The rest of this next slide is more things that are code based and some thoughts, you know, some different options for the, the committee, excuse me, council to think through. One would be um, the cumulative permit, uh, permit value start date. You know, we, when the code was adopted, we just carried forward what we'd always been doing, which was that 2004 number. So since 2004, we've been tracking permit values. So we would just carry that forward. We could uh, change that to 2019 when the code, this code was adopted, if you want to start that over again. There's pros and cons to everything we do, including, you know, this. You know, that would give everybody a lot more time. Uh, so it pushed improvement back, but again, it's kind of balancing. But that would apply to every way. That's the big project and small project. I mean, isn't the issue, I mean, because going back to 2004, you could do a lot of small projects, and like if you have a timeline that goes on in perpetuity, like you're eventually you're eventually going to discourage any more small investment because you're going to trigger all of these things versus I mean, we're, we're partly trying to capture you're making a bunch of investment in a relatively short period of time but I mean because we're going to have the same issue if you just reset the date is it better to reset the date or is it better to make this a 10 year cumulative permit versus a indefinite time frame. And so, it so you're rolling. it starts rolling as soon as you make it your first investment. It, and I don't know the answer, but that seems to be what the issue is. Yeah, and we could, uh, the rolling idea is something that we could certainly look at. I've got a couple more things on here, but I hadn't, we hadn't thought of that one. That's another way. And again, um, all of these site plan traders are, you know, we're trying to find fair ways to implement them. And, uh, but also um, try to get to where we're wanting to have improvements on our corridors. Um, you know, and also you know, sometimes the people that might strategically always place their projects, whatever projects they tackle in smaller. So I think there is some merit to the cumulative permit value, but there needs to be some bumper guards to it. The, um, another idea would be to cap site improvements as a percentage of the project budget for existing sites. So if you have an existing site, you're doing these renovations, um, we haven't done the research as to what makes sense, but you know maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 20% of your budget. The equivalent of that should be spent on site improvements. So that kind of so if it's a small it's scalable. So a small project, it's you know nominal amount of work. Large project, it's it makes more sense. So that'd be a way to scale it. Um, next would be to possibly create kind of a secondary set of standards for existing sites um, but that really kind of defeats the point of having design alternative review you know we're we're really here with the design alternative process to meet with people find solutions that are specific to their site so i don't know that that really gets us anywhere because um, we have the design alternative process another would be to expand the allowance for phased improvements the chapter 135 already has uh, phasing provisions where you can do uh, site and landscape improvements over a 10-year period if you're a site two acres or greater. We haven't had anybody take us up on that at this point. Um, but we could certainly look at, you know, do you reduce that to a small, do you allow phasing for existing sites or, or maybe give staff ability to make a judgment on that? I don't understand that. Expand allowance for phased improvements. Right now, the code allows you 10 years if you have a big site on your site plan you have the right to identify i'm going to do this much landscaping okay. now five it. years i'll do this much and then i'll be done in 10 years i got it so you don't have to build the upfront expenses or material for whatever right you can stretch it out and that's in there today we haven't had anybody take us up on it yet um, but that might be something where if, if you make it a half acre site or what <coughs> or give Maybe, maybe staff the ability to make an interpretation. So is there a way to incentivize existing sites to do their site plan updates, to do the updates that we're looking for for their, for their business? I mean, is there a way, I guess I would look at Scott, yeah. um, you know, is there some type of funding that we can, you know, 
what, what's going to happen, and I know it happens now, where people just won't pull for a building permit and they'll just do the work. And so it doesn't add up to that, you know, that, that trigger. And so we're, we're missing out on dollars for that. We're missing out on, you know, making sure they're building it correctly. But if there's a way to incentivize people to, okay, let's, let's bring it up to the, to the code that we're asking you to do, and this is how we're going to help you do this for this existing building. That would I that should be one of the potential options here. So, Councilman, I would ask staff for some more information on how often the site compliance is uh, complied with without any incentives, because oftentimes when you offer an incentive, you might have had seventy or eighty percent of the applicants already complying without incentives that now you're going to be paying for. So. I, I want to get an understanding of how often we have applicants come forward who work with us and are able to get this done without incentives. How about if it exceeds the permit value? Yeah, I think actually, I like the second one there that says there's like a 10%. So if you're doing right. any remodeling, you might have to add one tree or two trees or one island somewhere, that type of thing. And, and, and there's a bite size opportunity to, to get compliance. There's a lot of different ways we can resolve it, but I don't I don't want the answer to always be incentives because we have a lot of compliance already without incentives that suddenly whatever source we put towards it now has to be paid but in, what we're already getting. But in yeah. two thousand four we let them build a building like they did on the corner of yes. Douglas and Merle Hay. Now they're coming back to, to get a new tenant in there and we're saying, okay, you don't meet those standards that we allowed you. And that's a fairly, I mean, that's a fairly new building. What, yeah, what about the buildings that have been built in the 50s and 60s and had, you know, a, a current person in there and then now, now we're gonna switch it and, you know, th those are a lot of different changes that we're asking yeah. them to make. Thank you in the face. Yeah. I think the, at the very highest level we're asking commercial properties in, in these instances to take into consideration the importance of the, the site plan along with any improvements they're making to their building. And so that but that's the reason we've passed on to the tenant. You know that, right? I mean, yes. which is it, I mean, but it helps the whole area from an incentive standpoint, right? It, now the, yeah. that's the balance we've got to look at is there are there are develop there are parcels that aren't being developed today because of their neighboring parcels condition, right? I think we can all agree with that. And so we're trying to attack that with blight removal, we're trying to attack that with other, but one of the tools we, we have to leave on the table, we can change it, we can improve on it, but one of the tools we have to remain on the table is bringing older properties up to standard. Right? I hope we haven't lost sight of that. It, because it works we, both ways, right? Because like, if we're successful on a corridor and you give too many outs, exceptions, like you're gonna you're gonna freeze in an underutilized building on a corridor too. I mean, so this is the challenge here is we've got multiple pieces that we're trying to trying to do, right? Because I don't want. For example, like we just ran into this, I don't want the star gas station on Ingersoll to be able to get exceptions so that they can they can maintain their gas station use on, on the Ingersoll corridor because one, they've been a troubled property, but two, I, we can have a higher, better use there. And so you're gonna run into some of those if you create too much of a hole with the exceptions. So, I mean, I, I think there are a number of good ideas here that, that to me make sense to provide additional flexibility without completely eroding what we're trying to do here. So, I, I appreciate the thought that's put into this. I mean, I'd allow more phased improvements. Yeah, right. I like that. I'd, I'd be, I think, able to support a cap so, so that you know, you're making some improvement, but yes, anything that gets to keeps getting to that incremental improvement. But I just think, uh, speaking of triggers, um, so I think sometimes when um, someone, uh, uh, a, a company or a nonprofit is considering changes, and they they uh, are told. Um, 
this is going to trigger the cumulative value, and there's a lot of angst from from that um, owner, maybe not as skilled as um, navigating through the processes like Rich Eichner, but there's a lot of angst until they uh, find out what this really means and how many conditions are going to be waived and that pushback and the timing and the process triggers a lot of calls to council members and, and I think uh, a recent example that comes to mind is the Food Bank of Iowa. Michelle Book is very good at navigating through the um, social uh, aspects of the community, not so much for building and permit, but so that triggered a lot of calls to all the council members and the time and the extra dollars that she, she put into working with um, um, architects and such. So I think we need to really improve the process of uh, communication with the property owner like okay, we're, we're going to have to work with you on this and like, don't wig out on this, but you know, here's what we can do. So let them know up front that there are some um, <clears throat> staff steps and what the timeline is. Um, just be more helpful to the people that are trying to prove their properties. Did there I summarize that pretty well, Linda, with what happened on that? You, you did. Did. I, I could go back to the Donut King on East University. You know, we, we just made it so difficult for that property. But, you know, we're always looking to improve our processes and our communication. And um, I, I, the, but we need applicants to know to call us. So, I mean, I always would encourage you that if you have people say, you know, give Jason a call, talk to staff, they're there to work with you. Um, lots of times, uh, you, uh, what happens, but what frustrates me is when their first call isn't to us to even learn about the process um, and to let us explain things. So I, we will, I will work with our staff and push them to make sure that we're, you know, our customer service is on, on is what it's supposed to be. Um, but I, you know, I'd encourage you to encourage folks to talk to us too. Well, we're here to help. Kind of a freak out. For well, they, I mean, yeah. What the heck? Well, just you know, say it's okay. Talk, yeah. you know, talk to staff and see where it goes. And if you don't. If you if you if it doesn't pan out, you know if you have problems, let me you know get back to me. But you know give staff a try. Often we people aren't even contacting us first. You know they get mad and then they call you guys, which uh, you know, or they don't get a return call from. But I'm not saying that our I'm not saying that our staff is perfect or that our customer service. I mean, we have plenty of room to do better. I, I'm, so so it's great to hear you say that. And so instead of coming up with. No, you have to do this. This is what it says in chapter 134, 135. Being more customer oriented, I would I love to hear you say that and finding answers and finding solutions for them to say, yes, you have to do this, but we're going to give you X amount of time or we're going to help you or we're going to waive these things. I, I think that uh, at least some of the folks that, that we speak to, they're not getting those answers. And, well, yeah, and that's not your fault, and that, but you know, when that is what we're hearing. And I think to Carl's point, you know, we it's not always we get the first call. Typically, we get the call afterwards where it's like, you know, can you help us with this? This isn't, you know, I can't afford to do this. And well, and the other challenge, and this is nothing that we can fix, but I, lots of times we communicate with their consultant, and then the consultant. You know, I don't, I don't know how the consultant frames the discussion or what kind of light sure. put us in. Um, and that's why I always encourage direct conversation with staff before people get it. I agree, but just, you know, yeah. being customer-oriented and finding solutions and just not the hard no. Sure. You have to do it like this. That's, that's where I think the frustration for business owners and property owners um, you know, trying to just do business and keep their business and keep their property up, you know, they're, you know, they feel like they, they can't win. I think, too, some of the things being proposed, like the phasing in and some of those yeah. kind of things would be helpful, especially for small businesses. I know there's one on East Grand that 
sounds like an exorbitant amount of shrubbery and trees for the business they're doing, but is there a phased in, and I think we've worked with them, but even for, especially for small people, and a limited amount of space to try to figure out that, but to have a plan. You know, yeah. it's like, we want you to have a plan, we want you to improve your property with more green, and uh, I think that seems to be what I've heard, so. You know, we, and I'll use my example because I, I personally, we, we remodeled our business 25 years ago. In the middle of the neighborhood, everybody knows where it's, where it's at. You know, we're, we're a small business. You know, I did all the improvements. I planted the landscaping around the residential. But if I have to go back and tear up every nine spots in my parking lot, when I had to go buy houses to put additional parking there, that, that to me, is it, it doesn't make sense as a business owner that I'm going to now lose parking. And after I already went through the process, did the landscaping that was required, and you know, I now that we've changed it, now now it's an additional cost. I don't get back that money as a business owner. So that's why I'm asking you to look at it through a different lens as staff. Sure. As, as someone that has invested in their business and wants to continue to invest in their business, but the requirements that we're putting on them, it, it, it just doesn't make sense. It's like, okay, forget it. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to do anything else to the building. So that, that's, if you look at it through a different lens, and all of us need to kind of look at it through a different lens. I know not all of us have businesses and buildings in the, in the city, and you know we have beliefs and, and and fears that we need to do this extra thing, but we also have to look at it dollars and cents. And if we're not going to incentivize people to do it, that's a struggle. And and that struggle is real. And it's a dollars and cents. And you can't get around that. And so, you know, for from someone that has invested and, and has a business in our city and has made a considerable investment into a neighborhood, um, yeah, I mean it's I look at that trigger every single time. Dollars and cents and time. Well, yeah, time is, yeah. Well, I, 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 speaking of time, I appreciate everybody's time. Yeah, thank you. I really do. Sorry to ran long. Um, we'll, we're going to take feedback and, and work on some code amendment language and hopefully have some stuff that we can bring forward here in the early part of the year. So, Jason, what, going back to the A, HUs, uh -huh. where did we leave that regarding the conditional use? Are you going forward with your plan to um, not the entire city by right? Is that what you're going to bring? I, I think also? that to get something in place rapidly and then learn from it, I still think that's probably the best path forward. But I'm willing to go back and kind of look at this idea of the um, Boundaries and how else to do it, but but well, let's get some let's get I, I the like change the in place thing. rapidly. Just but I would appreciate out. the yeah, the boundary. Yes, like I don't want to delay getting getting this done so that we have it available by right in more places and we have the conditional use in place. Okay. But I would like to see the expanded and and the the minimum the minimum parking question. I know, for example. You know, on Ingersoll, when you have these redevelopment issues, sometimes parking is one of those site plan compliance issues that is an issue in being able to invest and redevelop. I would like to see on, on corridors, particularly transit accessible corridors, uh, I, I'd like to have more of a conversation on parking minimums for businesses and letting the market decide on the corridors what we need from a parking perspective rather than requiring that. Okay, yeah, we certainly can come back at a different time and talk about parking. Well, I'm not sure what we require to the brand new building on Ingersoll that was $3 million and they have very minimal parking. I'm not sure how they're ever going to stay in business, whether it's on a transit or what have you. Mm -hmm. I mean, a $3 million plus investment and they have maybe 15 or 20 spots there and they're not able to use it adjacent uh, parking behind them, I'm not sure how they're going to stay in business. So, 
I, 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 don't, I don't know how, it, and that's not our problem, and I get it, and we're not the ones. But, that, but that, that's the market that gets to decide that, right? Yeah. Right, rather yeah. than us requiring. No, I get it. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll, we'll be back. All right, thank you, everybody. And uh, I'm sure you're going to continue to get more questions, and uh, we're going to need to uh, sort this out sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, until later today, thank you all for attending this meeting. Sure.